Welcome to Social Sessions, where we discuss the real life stories of individuals who have overcome life's challenges and emerged stronger. Today, I'm excited to introduce our guest, Eddie Gorman, whose journey is a roller coaster of highs, lows, and ultimate redemption. Eddie's life has seen its share of difficulties, from serious crime to time behind bars, but he has managed to turn his life around in an inspiring way. Through his own struggles, Eddie has found a way to help others. He founded Harbour Ayrshire, a sanctuary offering support and hope to those facing similar challenges. Eddie's journey serves as a powerful reminder that even in the darkest times, there is hope for a brighter future. So let's dive in and hear Eddie's story firsthand. So welcome to Social Sessions. Uh, today we've got Eddie Gorman, who has had a fascinating journey through the criminal world and coming out the other side and now has a charity uh, all about recovery. So welcome, Eddie. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for having us here, mate. Um, so what I do with everybody, right, is just kind of take you back to your own kind of childhood background, stuff like that. So was it Ayrshire you grew up, Eddie? Yeah. Um, so how was that? Was it when that was you when you were younger? But if you, well, if you'd have asked me that 12 years ago, I'd, I'd have probably said that I was brought up in a, a normal household in a, yeah. in a normal area. The reality is I didn't know that at that time, but looking back, the only good thing about being, being brought up in a dysfunctional area or a, a dysfunctional family is you don't know it's dysfunctional, it's <laughs> normal. Yeah, exactly. But looking back, it, it was brought up in an alcoholic home. I've like, seen a lot, of, exposed to a lot of violence when I was younger. Aye. A lot of alcoholism in my family. If you shake my family tree, you'll get hit in the head with an, alcohol an alcoholic <laughs> or an addict who's right in our family. Uh, so, a lot of good times as well. Aye. Yeah. Uh, like, eventually end up staying with my nan and papa. So, there was, there was nine he's brought up in a three bedroomed house. Aye. So, it was like, and I describe it, it was like, it was like the Waltons. Aye. You know? Aye. It took you 10 minutes to say good night to everybody, good night, nan, and good night, papa, and stuff like that. But we ended up in the criminal justice system around addiction. Aye. So, we went for the Waltons to the Gallicals, out of shameless. Aye. But we're kind of all back in recovery now. So, it was back to the Waltons. Brilliant. But at that time, it wasn't, it wasn't looking back now. And what I know now, Sean, is it was, it was, it was dysfunctional and it was. Aye wasn't it good for world development? I think it's like, um, especially some of the guests we've had on here, it seems to be a kind of, like a recurring theme, do you know what I mean? And it always is, goes to kind of, you can always take it back to kind of social deprivation, uh, generational trauma, stuff like that, do you know what I mean? It's probably your your parents and stuff maybe experienced the same kind of stuff you experienced, do you know what I mean? And alcohol was a big factor in a lot of working class families back then. Um, so what happened, Eddie? How did you kind of come into the justice system? What, what, type, what age were you when you kind of first went in? In the justice system, the first time I went to prison, I was 27 years of age. 27? Yeah. That's quite old, Eddie, isn't it? Like, so you never done the YOs or anything? Absolutely, no. I was, Good criminal. I was really fortunate. <laughs> I, well, I used to say I never got any bother till I was 27, but the hell it was I never get caught till I was 27, Sean. <laughs> but, uh, so I was late. I was always on the periphery of just going to prison and Aye. care and getting involved with the criminal justice system a little bit, a, a lot of few good results when I was younger, Aye. court cases and stuff like that that went my way, but 27 was the first time I Aye. actually. So was, was, was it, were you kind of quite quickly going in, did you go into organised crime kind of at a kind of early age or was that kind of later kind of thingy? I don't, I don't know if anybody goes into organised crime right Aye. away or that's your intention. What happens is they start the same as we started, is like petty criminals and, and what happens, that kind of spiral is out of control. And before you know it, you're introduced with people who's maybe involved in that Aye. type of lifestyle and, and, and you're kind of led into that by Aye. the role models that's in your life at that time. I know. And I think that's done to kind of, when you're in the, the kind of schemes that you're in, the people that they have the big flashy cars, the big flashy motors and things that you're, Probably taught at school in some ways. I mean, we talk, we spoke we've spoke quite a lot on here about what what the curriculum is and why there's why there's no um, any kind of classes that teach you about yourself and teach you about the connection with yourself and how kids should be brought up like believing in that. Because if you a fair dysfunctional family and you realise that at a young age, you can work on yourself. Do you know what I mean? I think there is programs and start starting to happen. Hopefully. Um, but do you think that's something that would have helped you, Eddie? Because, I mean, you're quite switched on in a lot of ways. You've got quite a high level of awareness compared to a lot of guys that I, I've ever met in the prison system. So do you think that could have been something like if you were maybe a wee bit younger and somebody taught you to kind of have a connection or relation with yourself, do you think that would have helped you? Well, absolutely. Absolutely. If, looking back at my life and my childhood and growing up and stuff like that, there, there wasn't anything like that. Like not, nobody spoke about being in touch with self or a higher awareness right. or a consciousness or, or, or a type of like 
like a, a, a moral compass even that was taught to us. Do you know what I mean? So if we'd have been taught that at the school, school was never a good place for me. No. Because of the trauma I'd experienced when I was younger, eh, I just kind of, school just didn't, didn't attract me in any way, shape or form. And Aye. you're right, and it wasn't because I was unintelligent, because, because I was, it was because I couldn't apply myself. Aye. I couldn't focus. And, and if you look, the difference between eh, young boys and young lasses eh, that's experienced their adverse childhood experiences, the boys... The girls will internalise it. Right. Yeah. But boys will externalise it. So when you get into a class or a classroom that you're uncomfortable in, you'll misbehave because Aye. you're not comfortable in that situation. So there's a lot of aggression. And in, in my case, Aye. in particular, was I was, I was aggressive and I was shut down and I didn't, I couldn't build the relationships or the connections that I needed at that time to, to be able to focus in school. So the damage was done probably before I even went to secondary school. The damage Aye. was done when I, I mean, to give you an example, when I was 10 years of age, after the dysfunction before that, like my mum and dad split up, my mum was an alcoholic, my dad was a gambler and a womanizer and stuff like that. So when they split up, I went to Campbelltown to, to, to visit my dad Aye. in the summer holidays. And I drove him mad to take me out fishing in the boat and it was rough, the sea was rough. So it took him a couple of days to calm down, he took us out, but it was still too early. And what happened was it was a terrible accident and the boat capsized and my dad passed away. Aye, oh God, yeah. daddy. So I lost my father at 10 years of age. So, so Witnessing that as well, one was, aye. Absolutely, mate. And it was horrific, uh, but because I drove a mad to take me out fishing, at 10 years of age, I internalised that, God, Sean. Aye. What I did is I blamed myself for killing my dad. Aye. So uh, a really damaged wee boy at that age. Aye. Right? And, and what, after that, I just, that, that was, I mean, there was some trauma before that, but after right. that, I, that my life just turned. After that, oh, I can imagine. I don't even can it, but I can imagine. I mean, it's like it's it's one of these stories that you can't. You need to kind of live or even try and. I mean, you can empathise and try and have yeah. a bit of compassion, but you can't really understand that, Eddie. And so, did that kind of obviously play out um, in the way that you kind of grew up, teenage years and stuff like that, and. Absolutely. Aye. Absolutely. That, that was, uh, that was uh, the mitigating factor, I think, that led me to using substances. And, and if you listen to some of the professionals at the moment, they'll say that, that, that addiction or, or crime and criminality are, are a, a lifestyle choice. So we choose to go into Aye. the lifestyles. But when I sat in that, that emotional pain, because I was never able to express that I have a felt or have Aye. a thought about the accident, and, and I went to stay with my nan and papa after that, who were, who were wonderful people. Aye. And they were the salt of the art, the earth. Aye. They used to bring people, that everybody in our scheme would come to nanas and papas. Aye. Everybody called my nan and papa, nan and papa. <laughs> you know I mean? If there were three doors or four doors away, it was a nan and papa. Aye. So it was a great house to get brought up in. A lot of love. And uh, But they weren't equipped or trained or qualified to deal with a wee boy who'd experienced that, that, that trauma that I'd experienced. Aye. So my nana's answer was to this was, was to give me them. I'll look after him and just don't talk about it in front of him. I know. And that is the way that that generation would, were taught, but like Absolutely. they were taught and, and, and that a lot of people like that. I, I mean, you get, I, I was one of the ones that even teachers and that would say, you just got on with it and stuff like that. And I mean, I, th I hope that they're looking because they, we've spoke about it on here as well with social media and stuff like that. And the kids of the kids are exposed to a lot. Do you know Absolutely. what I mean? Um, I, I was looking at, I think it was TikTok or Instagram. I was just kind of flicking as you do and, I mean, you're watching gang fights and stuff like that, and it's glorified. They've got like 120,000 views on a, a gang fight, and you're like, why is this no getting shut down? Why is it you're trying to teach kids here? What is it you're trying to allow them to do here? There's, how are they, as you say, how are they going to internalise that when their friends are then acting it if they've maybe had trauma that's similar to you? And I've, I don't know if this, this might be a wee bit controversial, but I, you might be able to say this, Eddie. See, when you're... See, when you have got that kind of trauma and, it, and you play it out as a kind of youngster, do you think because of the way you act and maybe the name and reputation that you start getting, you start influencing others around you? Absolutely. Do you know what I mean? Uh -huh. So you start influencing. So that person, the people, they attract. Because I remember some of my pals and the pals I had were the kind of most damaged people. And you used to go, oh, I want to be like them. And... They're allowed out there, man. Dad lets them out to like yawn time, and mama fucking wants me in at 10 o'clock. Do you know Absolutely. what I mean? Um, but it's not if you're later on and you have a look back at it and you go, they were all traumatized. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They had maybe addictions in their family, stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. I mean, look, I worked in East End of Glasgow for a while there when I came to work the violence reduction unit, and that we were working with people who'd uh, criminal 
uh, convictions for violence. And we were trying to get them back into employment. But but 90%, I'm 9 out of 10 of the people that I supported in East End of Glasgow, they had one thing in common. They had the absence of a positive male role model in their life. Aye. They had nobody to teach them right for wrong. They had nobody to, 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 to navigate that, that, that moral compass that we spoke about earlier. Aye. So the guys were just running about, they were learning after people that were running about them. And, and if you, if you, I've got a saying that I say that you draw your own level of dysfunctionality. Aye. You're running about people who's the same as you. That's what we do. Totally. You're attracted to like, Aye. like attracts like. So you're all you're all learning off each other, right. and, and and there's nobody there to say that look. And if I had somebody at that stage, and this is what I try to be the role model in people's lives today, uh, and if somebody my, who was like me came to me when I was a young boy, that you spoke about earlier, right. and says to me, Eddie, see if you continue a life like this, right. this is what's going to happen, and see if you maybe come and get a wee bit of support and and, and deal with the the underlying issues that's causing your lifestyle, right. whether it's criminality, it's in prison, or whether it's. Uh, Addiction. Aye. The chances are, the chances are, this will happen. There was Aye. nobody ever that came that was in my life at that time that, that, that done that. Aye. As I say, I couldn't engage with my teachers. And I, looking back, I had really good people in my corner as well. There was people that tried Aye. to help me at that time in my life. Aye. But I just never had that ability to open up and to expose myself. I know because I didn't feel safe. Aye. And to feel safe, no, to get vulnerable, you need to feel safe. Totally. And I never ever felt safe mm -hmm. all my life. By the way. Aye. And I never felt safe enough to say, you know what, I'm really struggling with this. Aye. You know, that, that's the reason why the, the suicide rate for men's through the roof, because we can't get vulnerable. And especially the west coast of Scotland, I think, is, is really bad for it. Um, that's why the drinking culture, I think, is the way it is, and I think it's why the, 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 the drug rate's so high. Um, so I'll tell you, kind of, like, obviously, um, we're not here to glamorise crime and that's the absolute opposite but you did you did go to kind of heights of kind of organised crime where a lot of people didn't get to Eddie and it'd be interesting just to see how that affected you because obviously there would be a part of you that's flying with an ego and then there's another part of you kind of that would be driven by fear I always say fear drives you and you don't even know it because you go like that to people you've got anxiety and they go, I'm not scared of an MD. And I'm like, that's not what anxiety is, mate. Like, mm -hmm. totally right. I'm not saying you're scared of MD. But it's fear that's driving you. You don't understand it. You need to, if you rip it right back, it's fear. So what was your experience as a kind of in that kind of world, that kind of organised crime world? How were you running, Eddie, just on adrenaline? But, <clears throat> to touch on what you said there about fear, I, I was a wee boy, ten year old, a wee scared boy, Aye. ten year old, and that, and that just that was a that was a, a common theme all the way through my life. Aye. I was a scared big man, could never have admitted it that time, and didn't even know at that time, didn't Aye. know that till I came into recovery. Aye. And and the more the recovery that I went through, and the role models in my life at that time kind of taught me this Aye. stuff, and I was able to look back and see that, Sean. Aye. But everything I did in my life is fear driven. I know. So. And even if it was fear about the violence, was even about fear about people thought about you. Definitely. If you didn't fear about taking a back seat, aye. Do you know? And, totally. and in that lifestyle, you're talking about in that lifestyle, organised crime. If see the fear of losing face, I know it's it's, it's too high a cost to pay. Aye. You can't do that. I know. You can't like you can't. I know. Do you know what I mean? Aye. And uh, so so. And it doesn't happen now or night. I, I, I was supposed to be a roofer, by the way. That, <laughs> <laughs> I was. I know. I was, I was born and bred to be, to go and work on the roofs Aye. and just be a normal guy and go on with my life, right? But because of that that, that trauma, that the experience and, and the situations that happened in my life, I was I was on a roof one day and I was involved in petty crime and we was, we was, we was stealing and stuff like that. And, and it just spiralled again. You know, and I was on a roof one day and we got an opportunity to go and make a few quid selling drugs. And I, walked, and I made a decision, a conscious decision. Mm. I remember talking to my pal 20 years later. He was actually on the roof with me that day. And he went, Eddie says, you turn around and says to me, do you know what? I'm done with this game. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go and sell drugs. Mm -hmm. right? Aye. And he went, he's a millionaire now, by the way. Aye. He's stayed <laughs> on the roof, he's a millionaire <laughs> yeah, now, right? <laughs> he's an officer and he's getting more money. I walked after that and I walked into a lifestyle of crime. And first it was selling cannabis, but it just started to spiral Aye. out of control. And the more you go, it just it's, it's like, it's like, it's like, a vortex, you just get sucked into it and you adapt. I'm a master at adapting, Sean. I Aye. can do it absolutely anywhere Aye. that I go in life. I've done it through my lifestyle. You learn if you've experienced that, that trauma and stuff like that. You learn how to adapt as well. I've done it through my criminal justice. I've done it through the, the, the lifestyle in organised crime and new idea and, and I adapted recovery. it in recovery. Aye. That's how when I came Aye. into recovery, I just went, I just adapted to that right away. And I went, Aye. this is really lifestyle. This is what I've been chasing all my life. Because uh, obviously, like, 
I, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, Eddie, but I must admit, I was really surprised. I was really glad and then over the moon when I heard you were in recovery. Um, but it's like you are uh, definitely a person that if anybody can do it, if you can do it, anybody can do it, do you know what I mean? Because the the level that, that you go to and the, the kind of stuff that happens at that level is very hard to break down when you actually go back. I mean, it must have took you a long time to break down with the, the root of fear and actually realising that that's the, the driving factor, do you know what I mean? Because you see a lot of guys and... Um, a lot of guys I like, I've got like a lot of guys who you met in prison and stuff like that and, 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 and you can see it's all driving, it's all ego driven, right? And it's all kind of fear that's driving that, as you say, fear of losing face, fear of maybe people talking about you, fear. It's just bullshit, do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Pure bullshit. Absolutely. But in that prison environment um, or that organised crime environment, it's if you don't step out of it and take a look at yourself, you're, you're going to just, you don't know anything else. Do you know what I mean? That is your circle. And I think, how did you kind of get out? How did you kind of pull yourself away from it, Eddie? It's, see, the thing is, Sean, you don't know you're in it until you get out of it. Totally. Right? Yeah, and you know that with your own experience as well. So uh, you're, the norm, the abnormal becomes the normal. You, 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 you get catapulted in this type of life. Desensitised. Desensitised is the word I'm looking for, actually. I absolutely. And, uh, and you don't know anything different. That's why I'm saying that we brought up in a dysfunctional family. You don't know it's dysfunctional. That's your normal. And whatever, whatever you're used to doing, that's your normal. Yes. So mm -hmm. these, this, that lifestyle becomes normal and you don't really realise. And one of the biggest delusions or lies that I ever told myself when I was in that, that, that lifestyle was, I, I really don't know what the hassle is. I'm not hurting anybody except myself. Aye. Now, I went through people's lives like a tornado, my family, my community, you know, like everybody around about mm. me suffer from my lifestyle. Mm. That, that, that's that's the truth. But at that time, I didn't know that. I had, there was a pure lack of empathy for how that, that, that I, I had behaved. And I never learned that till I came into, till I went to work with Varnish Reduction. And I remember uh, listening to Karen McCluskey, Aye, who you do on one of your Aye. podcasts. Karen's my hero, actually. So Karen was saying, she was doing a presentation and she she walked past a woman and she took her scarf off and walked away with it. She went, do you know why I was able to do that? She says, because I didn't, I didn't show any empathy. And I thought, <laughs> I've been doing that all my life. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. And I didn't understand that. Do you know what I mean? I there was no awareness that, that how my behaviour was impacting on other people. Aye. And, and, and looking back, so see when you come out of that and you learn, and, and, and it's all learning, isn't it? Nice. It's, all, it's all passing through development stages, learning and growing and creating that level of consciousness and awareness. And and the more you know that, the more you... Remember, I'm in recovery now. I'm long-term in recovery, mate. Aye. I'm 11 and a half years mm -hmm. away from my last substance, and I'm, and I'm probably, I don't know, the last time, 2005, when I was in prison or something Aye. like that. So it's a long time that mm -hmm. I've been doing this for sure, and, 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 it, and, it's, been, and it's been a, a process. Aye. It's a long process, Eddie, and um, I'm going to take you to kind of prison life the new right and just talk about, um, obviously I'm kind of, <clears throat> I'm kind of hard on the prison right, and I know um, it's a hard job, I understand that, to what I don't, I don't like with the prison is the value system that they put out and um, they portray this value system about kind of, um, like the way they t treat people and just the uh, humanity and human rights and all this rubbish that I don't, I didn't see any Eddie, right? So, what did what was your kind of experience of prison? Um, because obviously you were kind of me in shots. Do you know what I mean? And uh, it was it wasn't. A, I thought shots was great actually. Like compared to look, it was terrible, right? But looking at the way I do well in that, where it was actually a really good prison. But I don't know what, what was your experience of that, Eddie. I've got a lot of experiences that, Sean. As you know, so eighteen and a half years I spent behind bars, and it was only three sentences. So it was three long-term sentences. Aye. So basically, I'd done a life in instalments because it was only a seven-month period and a ten-month period. Aye. When you were and, out, and between the time, so it was like it was like a long term, mate, and it was all over the UK as well. So Aye. I've got experience of both systems: the Scottish and English prison system. But when I went to prison in the early nineties, it was I don't. I imagine it's like that today, and I think there's been a lot of improvement in the SPS. Aye. In fact, I know there has, because I work with people like, like Natalie, and Aye. who works with Cisco and stuff like that. Natalie, Natalie she's amazing. But what they do is absolutely Aye. phenomenal, actually. We work alongside her with the charity Aye. I work for now. But when I went to jail in the early 90s, it was, like, it was horrific. Aye. I mean, I, I'm 27 years of age when I go to my first prison sentence, and I've done a couple of remands before that, but remands is no, as you know, Sean, is different for being convicted. When you go into a, a, a remand, 
I might get there, I will get Aye. out of day this, I'll get out, and you don't really know where you're staying in. Aye. But once you're in there and you know you're staying know, in you're, there for a period of time, Aye. and my first sentence was actually three years. I get three years for something I've never done, actually, Aye. my first Did prison you? sentence. Oh, God. <laughs> so the QC, after the High Court trial, the QC is to me, after the three-year conviction, he comes in and he says to me, we go a draw. I says, we got a draw. I says, I've done three years. I've got three years for something I've never done. Aye. He says, I'd be getting not proven for, for 11 things you did do. <laughs> <laughs> I know, he's, that's right. I know, but he's, you're Absolutely. not looking at it, but you're going, I've never done the thing. Like looking back, I can see it now, but then I, then I couldn't see that, Sean. But going into that, that, that prison, it was A Hall in Berlin in 1992, and it was absolutely horrific. Aye. Uh, terrified, actually terrified, but no being able to show it, show it or express it, because as soon as you get near the mass one, mm -hmm. And we're hundred percent of our prison population wears masks. Yes. And the only time they come off is when that door shuts behind us at night time and you can just go I, I don't care who you are by the no, way, unless no. you're a I sociopath. Agree. I agree. Does that mean you've not got the types of feelings? Sociopath, that, psychopath, I, I absolutely. agree. Absolutely. Right. So when I knew at that time it was slopping out, so we're all queuing up to use sinks, say teenies to use sinks, it was slopping out. You were gallon containers to just wait to to use to use a toilet to to to, to, to Put out the smell was horrific. No, you know, see if you're not used to that. See when no. you go into that for your first time, man, it's it's eye opening. Very scary. Um, very uh, degrading stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? Um, but obviously, on you go, Eddie. Like it's it's it's, it's like I totally agree with you. I totally degrading. Yeah. And I was just what was because um, when I was in there, it was like drugs were rife, violence was rife. Um, no, no, as much in shots. Do you know what I mean? Shots was actually pretty good. Do you know what I mean? It was when I went to Adiwell that that, that I, the problems kind of started. Do you know what I mean? I don't know if that was just because it was a, a new prison opening up and it, they didn't really know what to do. And I understand that. Um, but shots was probably my favourite. Of all the all the prisons I've done, and, and probably a lot of people are scared of shots because it's the big shots and it's like all oh, the kind of big things and. Uh, I thought that shots was good, do you know what I mean? I don't know how you you felt about it. I mean, it wasn't good, it's hor horrific, oh yeah, do you know what I mean? Oh, it's traumatising, but I'm just in the prisons, I mean, in the, the balance of prisons. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that, uh, between, the difference between where I started and my journey with the prison system and, and shots and other prisons at the event, it was a wee bit more relaxed and, and a bit more laid back. And But that time in Berlin, it was a lot of violence. and. Aye. And there's, there's been drugs everywhere, and, and I had a big, a major part in playing that. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't be clean, Sean. I couldn't Aye. get clean. I couldn't cope. See, when I was clean, I couldn't cope. See, Aye. if you've used drugs for 11 years of age and I it's know. all you know, mate, I, I was never going to do well with drugs in my no. system. It just wasn't there, right? And that's why that's why I used substances every single day. I was in prison for the 18 Aye. and a half years, mate. And the only time I never used them was when uh, I couldn't get them. Aye. Do you know what I mean? When I was in the digger or rolled up or whatever the case may be. So... Die shots is much more laid back, uh, and it was. I don't know. They, they seem to have a bit more understanding. It was, they were dealing with a different client of prisoners as well. I think. I think the, the early doors and, and and way back then, it was just getting people in, housing them, and then getting them back right. out. And, I, and by the way, see when I talk about, I'm not criticising any wardens mm -hmm. or. Prison officers or statutory no, services. It's your systems that's broken, aye. Sean. Totally. No, no, the, the, the staff are off. The, the staff. To me, the 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 staff. I don't blame anybody. It's just it's, it's a system that's broke. I don't blame anybody, and I don't. Mm -hmm. I've met so many prison staff that are lovely people. Mm -hmm. I've met loads of prison staff that I can see are traumatised. Mm -hmm. I've met loads of um, prison officers who are who are. Um, like gang mentality because of that's what the, the, they've been the, the environment sucked them up do you know what i mean the environment's desensitized them and they've become part of that toxic environment yeah. so what i see is what i see and it's just a switch over to the criminal world it's the same thing it's the same set of rules it's happening it's universal laws that's happening you can't you can't break what, how a human body works, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So if you all work in the same system and you're in the same system, you're going to feel the same feelings, feel the same emotions, do you know what I mean? Absolutely. So I don't blame anybody. What what, I, what my problem is, Eddie, and you might disagree, man, and uh, I just wish they would come out and go, look, the, the system's broke. If you want us to warehouse people, we'll do it. But don't ask us to change people and rehabilitate people when we can't do it, we can't fund it, we can't do it. You look at Berlin and Berlin is so progressive now. Absolutely. You look at the other jails, Eddie, and you're like, what's happening? And even Natalie and that will tell you, do you know what I mean? Like, there's still not enough done. Even though Natalie's got so much, Natalie will tell you that we still need more. It's a pinhead. I mean? well, it's um, a pinhead. 
but it's amazing what's happening it's, it's, and what Natalie's done in there is outstanding. And then you go look at uh, other prisons and it's no getting rolled out. I'm mm. going, why is it? Why are you not going, right, that's working really well there. Let's get this into every prison. I, that's what my beef is, Eddie. I don't understand the the waiting, the waiting on it. Do you know, what are they waiting for? Do you know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. you, you're, you're watching a system where suicide rates gone up, addiction rates gone up, um, the drug trends are really bad. Fentanyl is potentially going to be hitting there soon, which is, they're, they're not ready for fentanyl, do you know what I mean, in there? So that's my beef, but you might disagree, Eddie. No, no listen, absolutely, I do agree. It's, again, it's the system's not set up to deal with it. The serious stuff that you're wanting to happen Aye. in the prison system, it's just not geared up for that at the moment. I know. So conversations like this and, and, and people that see like James Dockett, you had on the podcast, now I'll speak about James a wee bit later on, but James was a, 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 had a real impact on my recovery and, and my personal life, my professional life as Aye. well when I went to work with the VRU. James has got a real gift. James is one of, I believe, one of our best keynote speakers in Scotland. Yes, I've said it before. Aye. So, so James hasn't been able to go and articulate and express himself because James has got uh, contacts and he's got relationships with Aye. people who can make the differences and mm -hmm. make the changes because the changes are not going to come for the, the prison system. No, it's going to come for the for the for the people who's making Aye. the decisions in, in the prison system, and it has got to change mm -hmm. because what we're doing now is we've got a revolving door. I, I worked in a as a, a navigator, which was based on accident emergency. Mm -hmm. And what we used to see was people coming out of the prison system on the Friday, right, going back to what they know, and I'll talk about this later on as well, going back to what we know, going back to drugs, and we're in the hospital on a, on a Saturday or a Sunday. Yeah. And I used to say, listen, I'm standing at a revolving door here. Mm -hmm. And they would go back to prison on the Monday, the police would bring them actually into the hospital, and then we'd take them back to cells, and they'd go back to jail I know. after their whatever time they'd done in, 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 in the cells and go back into the prison. So we need to start doing stuff in prisons. And you're right, listen, there's stuff happening. And I, and I, I always like to focus on the positive, Sean, right? I totally understand and I get where you're coming from, but there is the, the, there is a mindset, there is a change in the mindset of the people that is making mm -hmm. the decisions. They know what we're doing isn't working. Right. When you look at the stats of the people that's so short-term prisoners, 90% of short-term prisoners are back in prison here. So, so what we're doing is not working for them. And right now they've just not got the, the setups just not there to, to support them through that any journey or any any more of recovery right. or redemption or whatever words or terms you want to use. It's just not happening in there at the moment. So what we need to start looking at is your recovery calf as you've got in. Right. Lenny Pierce, I think, has got, got a recovery calf right. as well, and they're doing well in there as well. So the SPS, I think Addy Wells maybe doing some really good stuff as well. Uh, <laughs> maybe not so much, I, No, no, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I know there's there's some good things going on uh -huh. in well. Um, I'll tell you a couple of phone calls I've had recently in the last couple of weeks is for staff and shots as well. So there's aye. people getting back to us, so they're contacting us in Harbour and asking us if we can engage with the guys when they get Probably. out. So, so they are doing something, but the, the problem with that is, and I say to them, is you need to contact me before that and I'll come up and get the relationships built with the guys before they get out. So as you trust me enough aye. that when they get out, I'll be able to support them. We're actually trying to get get uh, some of the projects that we're running, try to get them into prisons now as well with aye. Harbour. Again, for that reason. Uh, and so, listen, there, there is changes, there's, there's, and it's never going to be, it's a prison service, it's never going to be, it's like trying like to turn a, a liner, man, it takes I time. Know. No, I understand, like, it's, it's, it's with the prison system, it's like, um, I, as I say, I've met so many people that, in Ad, in Adwell included, so many people in Adwell that want change, so many people, but what I hear for the boys and stuff, is it's not it, there's no it's not going to, it's not getting took to ground level it's no nothing happening there's no change yeah um people are trying do you know what I mean and, and as I say it's a it's a beast it's like a fucking big big machine that you're trying to change you've got uh, politics that come into it you've got social people you've got the social the social thought process on prison what people think um are there as people ready to accept a kind of more restorative process in prison is, do you know what I mean? There's a lot at play, do you know what I mean? And unfortunately, justice ministers can win points by going a hard line on prison, do you know what I mean? And, and taking that hard line approach. Yeah. Um, and as I say, it's what the politicians do and what the legislator does that actually affects the prison. It's no, the prison are just doing what they're, mm -hmm. they've got. I mean, they're, they're covered by red tape, do you know what I mean? They can't do this, can do that. So they're only doing what they can do, do you Absolutely. know what I mean? So... My whole the whole thing with the prison system is just I watch people people that I love pals that I've made and I watch them making no progress 
um, lifers who are 20 year over the tariff, 15 year old, 10 year over the tariff, and they'll get failing at the top end and kick back and get kicked back. And it's all through drugs. Oh, yeah, Eddie, you know the prison system runs on drugs. So my whole thing is, is why are you punishing? Why are you try to punish, still punish addiction? The mat standards are only getting put out. They're still not getting, they're trying. I mean, this is what I'm saying. People are trying techniques, but I don't know, Eddie. I just don't see, I don't see the big change that other people see. Do you know what I mean? I just see the ground level, it's not happening. No, I get it, mate. I get it. And uh, the thing is, right, being soft on crime isn't going to be a vote winner. No. So you're not going to get your your, 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 your ministers that want to, want to come out and say that. Scottish government's a wee bit, I would think, a bit more progressive Aye. in looking at stuff like that because we understand who Scotland's an ace of your nation. Angela Constance seems to be quite good. Do you know She's what I mean? She's great. She I'll, does. Tell you, I'll tell you a wee story about Angela when we started Harbour Aye. in a wee minute, right? But uh, so, so, But if you look at it, right, if you look at the cost... This is question been asked to me on numerous occasions is look, why are you supporting people? Why are you supporting criminals? Why are you supporting people who's violent? Now, because I understand violence, Aye. if you are exposed to violence or younger, you're, you're predisposed to be violent later on in life. Right? So because we understand that, I can be more effective at helping Aye. people through that. Right? So see if you take it as even if I can help one person who's involved with violence or criminality or even an addiction, you're taking away all the victims for that person's life. So Aye. we're reducing the impact that people's behaviours is have on victims. Aye. right? So we're reducing victims first and foremost, which is probably the most important thing. Definitely. But if you look at it for a financial aspect, so numerous case studies showing the boys that I've supported, right? They've been through the criminal justice, they've been on addi mm -hmm. in addiction services. One, one, one guy was has been in and out of prison all his life, basically, right through the care system. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've not got a figure of how much that costs, right? But it's an absolute fortune. What is it? It's like 50 grand a year they're talking about to keep Aye. somebody in prison. It can be more than if, if somebody's got, um, like, it depends on how much, like, the health can do. A lot of people are bad on a lot of meds, on a lot of kind of things, you know what I mean? Cost a yeah. lot of money, do you know what I mean? So, I have about Absolutely. 50 grand, Eddie. Aye. So, you take the 50 grand, I think it's, it's, it's 8,000 prisons we've got in Scotland mm -hmm. at the moment, isn't it? So, it's mm -hmm. 40 million, 400 million Aye. quid can into fill the SPS, right? So, so, say 50 grand on an average Aye. person to keep somebody in prison a year. And their addiction services and and all the different mm -hmm. no you know the different ah, things that cause people that on, in, on their benefits on the rest of the stuff mm -hmm. right see if we take that away and get people uh, really positive support when mm -hmm. they're leaving prison right give them a, give them an understanding of what it is that they're up against mm -hmm. try and support them after the substances right because mm -hmm. I I'm, I'm a really believe strongly in abstinence right mm -hmm. I'm a, I've got a mind journey through abstinence and I've supported a lot of people into abstinence based recovery now. Get people off of drinking drugs. Let them tackle the underlying issue, Sean, which mm -hmm. causes drinking drugs. When I went to, when I went through my own moral recovery, and and, and I sat down with a man, and he took me through the positive role model that took me through this work. And the first thing that that we, we spoke about was that the accident that happened to my dad, right? So mm -hmm. for nearly forty years, I blame myself for killing my dad, right? right? So the first question he asked me about that was what happened and I told Aye. him the story and he, and he says to me Sean and this was it was like this was life changing for Aye. me by the way he says to me Eddie you was a 11 year old boy and you wanted to go fishing with your dad Aye. that I was know. the first time I'd seen the first time I, I knew that mate I, I, I had never been able to a, a express know, myself Aye, Aye. to somebody but B to get that feedback for somebody mm -hmm. who which was the Aye. truth by the way so see when I was starting to do that and start to deal with all the underlying issues and learn some healthier coping strategies mm -hmm. to deal with whatever life is going to throw me going forward. I don't need to use drinking drugs, Aye. right? And see when that level of, when you go through that, that therapeutic model of recovery, I understand I've got awareness, I start to create compassion. Aye. We talk about the brain starts to develop properly mm -hmm. again and the neurotransmitters start to, 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 to mould and all of a sudden I can start to, start to live life, function in life as a normal person. So if we're getting people out of the criminal justice system like like me and the impact financially and harmfully mm -hmm. on on the public, then I'm, I'm a full self-support member of society. Right. And, I, and I've showed enough and numerous people how to live a life without using substances mm -hmm. and without getting involved in that lifestyle. 
thinking of financial impact that that's having on people. I know. And I've shown a case study after case study after case study. If you're at that place where you're ready to accept support, mm -hmm. whether you're coming out of addiction, whether you're leaving the criminal justice system, the two of them so tied in Aye. that it's no true. If you're at that space where you're ready to access support and you and you introduce to somebody who can take you through that, mm -hmm. that, that model of recovery and offer you that opportunity, then the impact financially and socially that has it's going to have on your, your communities is is, 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 mind, is mind blowing actually. Oh, it's, it's it's phenomenal the amount of money that you would actually save and being able to put back into society and uh, build stuff. You would be able to build more charities like Harbour, build more charities like Cisco. But I mean, it's it's building places that people feel safe to go into. The Recovery Cafe was the first place I'd been to Eddie, where. Uh, I'd seen people truly getting vulnerable and stuff in prison because you know yourself, we, we spoke about it earlier, uh, the guys in there don't know that they're running on adrenaline and ego and stuff like that, do you know what I mean? And um, you obviously had an interesting kind of experience with the kind of two different sets of prisoners, um, prisoners who were kind of locked, dubbed up because maybe they had... Um, well, I'll let you tell it. It was like obviously the guys that had been dubbed up and 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 had maybe had to go in behind their doors for whatever reason, maybe owed money or whatever. Yeah, but yeah. on you go. You can you can. Yeah, absolutely. We're, 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 we're protection. The, 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 there were two two different halls. You get mainstream and you've got protection. And protection people go behind the door. We call it for for various reasons. Aye. And some of them is it's just they're just no coping. I know. Yeah. So we were able to when I worked with the violence reduction, we were able to take a program into Shots Prison, and we're working with the two categories of people. And what they were seeing was that the people who were on protection, what were really engaging with is much better. And when the staff asked me why 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 is that why is it is it, is, is, it, is the people in, in protection much more engaging than the people that say uh, that's in mainstream, and I knew it right away, Sean. Right. I knew this from my own experience, mate. See the people that had been either put themselves or been put on protection, their ego had been smashed. Aye. They 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 weren't living it in the so life. They, 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 they were only some wee guy or this wee ticket that we think we are or this big gangster that you think mm. you are because it's all the same stuff. By mm. the way, it doesn't it matter is. what level mm. you're at. You've got the the the, 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 the ego causes a delusion that gets you to the mind made false sense mm. of self. Eh? Carl told talk about it, didn't he? Aye. That's Aye. what it is. Definitely. So when you have to take this humiliating experience, like going behind your door in a prison, because it's the worst thing you can do. Aye. If you're in, you know what I mean? if you're in that life, in right. that lifestyle, yeah. And that was the reason. The guys who had to had to face that humiliating experience had seen the truth that they weren't what their mind had told them they were. Well, it's a fascinating concept. It's I'll ask you this any a really hard question. How do you smash these egos, the big egos? You need to try and get back humility. Right. And normally with humility comes after humiliation. Aye. Even when you come out a a, a lifestyle of crime, it was it's hard for me, Sean, to get away from that lifestyle of the, the criminal mm -hmm. the criminality aspect of my lifestyle and it was to come away from addiction. Mm -hmm. But I knew because prog addiction is a progressive illness and by the time I was 45 is when I did came, mm -hmm. come into recovery, there had been so much pain caused actually through my addiction. Mm -hmm. You know, like when I started first started using drugs, it was drugs was supposed to be my problem. Mm -hmm. Drugs is my solution, Sean. Aye, aye. I, I, I used, kept you going. I, I used I, drugs as a coping mm -hmm. strategy. So if I'm a wee ten year old boy or eleven year old boy when I started using the substances, it was like the first time I used man, Sean, it was like oh, that's I, what it's like, man. I know. Relief. Yeah. I. So so later on, but because of the progression of, of the disease of addiction, later on in life, drugs there's consequences of my using after mm -hmm. that. And and what happened to me was I'll tell you what what kind of smashed my ego was when I came out of my last prison sentence actually which I don't really want to speak about because ah, I don't right. want to have an mm -hmm. impact right. on the, 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 the victims of that crime. Uh, I'd seen the truth, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? And and, and something happened to me and it kind of, it was like, it's just like a moment of clarity, Sean. It's like, right. what am I doing? Mm -hmm. 45 years of age, by the way, mm -hmm. or 44 years of age at this time. What am I doing? And I seen that truth about, see that lie that I told myself all my life that mm -hmm. I don't know what the hassle is, I'm not hurting anybody by myself. Aye. I seen that was a lot of shite. Aye. So so the 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 experience starts with seeing a wee bit of truth, right? Now, everybody that's listened to this, aye. I'll know there's been times in your life when you wake up to the truth. Oh, aye. We don't always stay awake because mm -hmm. we can fall back into delusion. Aye. But, and I didn't either actually. 
And I thought to myself, there must be a better way of life mm-hmm. than the way I'm living at the moment. And I left prison. And all I did was fall right back into lifestyle. Mm-hmm. But that truth was there. I can't, you can't, you can't, you can't get rid of it. Once you, once you, once you hear it, once you feel it, you can't get rid of it. It's there. Absolutely. Um, and, I, and I come out, Sean, right? And, and I went right back into lifestyle again, right? But, but no, this, no to the same extent I had. But then, and I knew where I was going this time. I knew I was going back to do another double figure sentence. But the difference because I'd seen that wee bit of truth was I, I knew, right? Aye. I knew wholeheartedly there wasn't another double figure sentence in me at that time. Aye, well, aye, that's the aye. truth. Aye. I couldn't have told you this 10 years ago, aye. but that was the truth. Aye. And, and I thought, I need to do something about this. And and so that's experience aye. that brought the truth in me because the ego's all about delusion and denial, mm-hmm. isn't it? And, and when you see the truth and you can act on that truth, what you've got is a window of opportunity. So when I got to that stage where I was ready to turn my life around about, people actually started showing up my life that could help me. I, synchronicity is a thing, do you know what I mean? Carol Jung speaks about it. It's a, it's a thing when you start on that path and you open up, the life, universal laws synchronise with you and people start appearing to help you and stuff like that, do you know what I mean? And it's whether you take that opportunity, do you know what I mean? We pass up opportunities all the time and we will say, <clears throat> you do need to take a lot of response. Not a lot, at the start, it's hard. You do need to take responsibility for your actions, which is hard. Yeah. So you need to go like that to yourself. Did I put myself in that position? I did. Did, could I have done something differently? I, I could have done something differently. I might know, might, that might know, I might not have done what things, what other things, but I need to take responsibility for the parts that did lead up to that. Do you know what I mean? So that is very hard. And it's very hard when you've got people in about your life who don't think like that, who can easily go, Eddie, shut the fuck up. What are you talking about? And you can easily go, what am I doing, man? Talking so much shit to myself. Absolutely. So you need these people in your life that, it's hard because if you know yourself, Eddie, when you're you're living that life, it's only the only people that are running about you, people that you trust and people that are living that life. Do you know what I mean? So it's like I went to a funeral, right? I came out to a funeral. Um, it was my uncle's funeral, and uh, I was a wee bit kind of part a bit part of it. It was my first. I was on an SEL, so I was coming out for Berlin. My uncle Tam had died, I think you know my uncle Tam, and, uh, and my uncle Tam was it had died in. Uh, Big Mick Healy and James and all that were all there and so they're all kind of congregating at the one but they're all kind of sitting at the one but and all my mum and all that and all the kind of people that kind of live a straight life are all kind of mm. that side so there's only a wee bit Mick and a few other people right when I came out of the prison I hadn't seen all these people all these people but I, I got I went to the Micknet because I didn't feel people were coming up and going how are you Sean and all that and I I felt safer going, what's happening? And then them going, how's so-and-so in there? And so tell him, and I was asking, do you know what I mean? So you, and it hurt my mum because my mum was like, why did you not come and stand with us? And I was like, I did, but I didn't feel as if I fitted in. Mm-hmm. And that was a realisation for me. But the thing is, Eddie, this is where I, 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 I kind of drop. I go, I've always known that I had a wee bit of, mere awareness and a lot of the guys in the prison and a lot of guys in the prison are really really dulled down Mm -hmm. um and i I always say how do we how do we go in and life coach them how do we teach them how do we teach them about awareness is it just telling them about like eckhart toll and maybe putting into layman terms the untethered soul books list you know what i mean gabber matty is it is it showing them this Mm -hmm. or do you how would you go about it? I don't know. How how would you go about it, Eddie? Well, we tried to do it. We tried to do it when it was with VRU. We tried to take a programme into shots and it was lifers, just mentoring lifers. It was like a mentoring programme. Do you know what I mean? Like guys who'd maybe came, like maybe yourself, who's somebody who had a wee bit of mere awareness about, about life in mm-hmm. general and about the, the nonsense that we tell ourselves Aye. in there. Do you know what I mean? And role models again, positive Aye. role models in their life and just try and teach the other, the other mentors that, you know? Aye. But that, see, that thing is, that's, you, you'll always go back to what you're comfortable in, Sean. Oh, aye. And, and if you're standing with your family, we see it a lot of time in recovery, I'm, I'm really uncomfortable in about my family, aye. because I'm, but, but I'm comfortable, I'm, whatever your comfort is, with your normality, if you're normality yeah. for 15 years, 
as being to this is the guys I'm going about, then that's what's normal to mm -hmm. you. And it's easy to just go in and just fall into that, that the, the dialogue and you know, <laughs> the, all the banter and stuff. Like that. Absolutely, that. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. It's like when, and I think that the transition period can be really difficult for people mm -hmm. to get away from that. But see, when you've had the experience that you know that that lifestyle is not for you anymore, see, when you've Aye. had that experience, you know it's not for you. You know, know. it's not real. Because it isn't real, Sean. No. Do you know what I mean? It was never for me, Eddie. Never. No. It was like, I mean, I never ever, I was only 19 when I went to prison, do you know what I mean? And I was never in, but I knew people who were like in that life and I still did, do you know what I mean? I know people that, old friends that have been doing that road and stuff and I can see through it. And I'll tell you, I see a lot of my pals who are in that life. Um, they they'll reach out to you when they're, they're in need of help. Do you know what I mean? They'll, they'll like, if they'll, and I, 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 they'll phone you when they need to speak to somebody and offload. Oh, Sean, I'm, I'm hanging. You feel like a, a, a kind of, an agony. Aye, like, aye, like an agony, <laughs> do you know what I mean? And it is always just saying, look, you need to get yourself away from the rubbish, do you know what I mean? And uh, there's nothing I can do. I can't, I can't do it. You need to do it yourself, do you know yeah. what I mean? There's absolutely nothing. But it is, it's about taking responsibility and just saying, look, I need to, I need to change. Do you know what I mean? I need to, because you can become comfortable in trauma and you can become comfortable in addiction and come comfortable in a, a shite life, a, a shite mindset. Mm -hmm. And when you try and pull yourself out, you, your, your body will resist it because it's comfortable. So you, it's trying to break through that. Do you know what I mean? You need to realise that that resistance will break, mm -hmm. but it's just trying to get, that enough people run about you. Support network's massive, Eddie. Support network's one of the biggest things you, you need. Gabber Marty that you always talk uh, about and who you like, Sean, he says the opposite of addiction is connection. Definitely. It's about relationships. Totally. And see what we were trying to do in shots with the guys. We were trying to create relationships with people. And that's what I do. I've got really good interpersonal skills. Aye. And I've had them all my life. You have. To, to, listen, to you, to be involved in organised crime, you need to have something about you. Aye. You, Aye. you, Aye. you need to be good at relationships. That's Aye. the reality. Now, however way you form the relationships, you need to be good at relationships. So I, I get, I go at that with the connection party. That, that's, if you can connect to somebody who is, it's like, I think Anne-Marie Ward mentioned that when she was doing your Aye. podcast, another absolute Aye, star in my eyes as Aye. well, by the way. She mentioned social contagion. Aye. See whatever you're running about, that's what you're going to be then. Definitely. So if you're running about with nine people who smoke, there's going to be ten smokers in that mm -hmm. group. So so the mayor can be exposed to positive male role mm -hmm. models of life. And it helps if you've been through the, an experience yourself. Like guys like me, people will tend mm -hmm. to listen to them when I was the navigator of what the next emergency. So the navigator project was a, it was a project with the violence reduction unit in partnership with Medics Against Violence. And we went into hospitals with people who'd been assaulted, severely assaulted, and we would do interventions in the hospital bed. So I would go to people and I would say to them, listen, uh, uh, and, uh, and I kind of, because my background's addiction, I, aye, I, 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 I want to help addicts. Aye, that's aye, all right, that's aye, my passion, that's aye, where aye. my passion lies. I love it, I'm good aye. at it, I, 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 I've, I've, I've been a lot of experience aye. in it. So so I started kind of developing the project without telling anybody if we have a violence project, <laughs> an addiction <laughs> project, right? And what I'd go to people's hospitals beds who was lying right. there, either maybe being assaulted or coming mm -hmm. after an overdose or whatever the case may be, it was uh, anything that was non-medical that the, yes. the doctors couldn't mm -hmm. really treat, we we done interventions. And I would go to people's hospitals beds, sure, and I would say, listen, I, I'm not arrogant enough to say, or, sorry, I'm not arrogant enough to say I know how you feel, mm -hmm. but I know how I felt and my life is spiralling out of control. Mm -hmm. See if you gave me a wee chance to help you, I can maybe help you get away from this lifestyle mm -hmm. if you're at that place where you're interested. Mm -hmm. And I would sit down and I would get him a sandwich, get him a wee cup of tea, because we'd time in there. Aye. Not all the medical staff were there, were all really busy and under a lot of pressure, and we'd sit down and just give people a bit of time. And the impact that that had for somebody at that low spot in their life, and again, we're talking about what smashes your ego, things like that smashes your ego, experience like that can smash your ego. Getting leathered like that and whatever, getting high, I even overdose it, I Whatever, mm -hmm. whatever mate, and, you, and you're at that place where you're ready to accept support. Karen McCluskey talks about a, mm -hmm. a reachable and a teachable moment. Mm -hmm. See if you're at that reachable and teachable moment and you get introduced to the right support mm -hmm. at that time, mate, it's life changing. Definitely. Or it can be a life changing. I think um, that's probably where I, I, I've, I mean I do a lot as well, Eddie. I try and think a lot and try and see where we can put this in, see where we could do that and see where the gaps are. But this is where I struggle with things, right? Like, see if you're in a prison system, you know yourself, right? One guy can change a whole, can change the full dynamics of a whole, right? One guy can come in with a big ego and it changes Absolutely. everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So 
that one guy with the big ego, how do you smash that? It's very hard, right? And I've, I don't know, I've not got the answers for it, right? I've no, because so there's some people that um, would think they're taught a lot of shite, they know, and mm -hmm. taught a lot of pish, do you know what I mean? And and, and would, would enforce that on other prisoners, if that makes sense, Absolutely. do you know what I mean? So that's where my problem lies. So I, I say, Scott, listen, Scotland's small enough, right? To have different prisons, to have prisons where when you go into Berlin, you go, what is it you like? Oh, I don't know, man. Like, well, what would you like today? I don't know. I've always wanted to be a fucking roofer. Right, well, do you know what? Shots in that day, roofers. So that you go up there. If you keep your head down and don't do it, and that you'll learn how to do roofing. If you come in and you're, I don't give a fuck who you are, I don't want to learn that, and I don't want to. Well, there's a jail there for you and all. Absolutely, mate. If you all want to put, go put them all together, and I, I'm not saying that in a bad way. Mm -hmm. The people will thrive in that. There's people that will, but take them away for the people who want to, to change. You can't, you can't change it. There's people, certain people with, with, with really big amounts of power in prison who have got an effect on what happens, do you know what I mean? And how do you try and pick? Because they, they're entitled to it and all when their moment comes, they're entitled to go, right, I want help then, do you know what I mean? So Absolutely. how do you, it's a, it's a beast, do you know what I mean? But the, 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 the psychologist talks about ages and stages, right? See the people aye. that you're talking about, they think we're talking like a shite, listen, and God aye. bless them, I'm there for them too, man, right? That's aye. the truth. Same, same. That's the truth, aye. mate, right? But see the reality is that just means that they're not that place where they're ready to see what, we, what I've seen. Aye. Now, I'm not trying to convince anybody mm -hmm. that they need to turn their life around about or change their life. If people's right to do what they're doing, that's absolutely fine. I know, I definitely. Can't, I can't the end about that. The people that I'm hearing, the people that I want to reach out to Sean as the people that's maybe saying to sell that lifestyle is no for me. Because mm -hmm. it might, listen, it might be for some people and some people might be successful in it. Mm -hmm. I, I was financially se successful mm -hmm. in that, that game, but it stole my soul, mate. I know. It stole my heart. Mm -hmm. It stole everything, every, every, every bit of goodness that was in me. No joy in it. took no. it away. There was nothing in it, mate. Even me wanted money, there was, not, there, was no, there was no goodness in it, mate. I know. When you even think about, like, I've spoke to people before and um, the good times are you're on the phone constantly and it's it's just all go. There's no relax, there's no chill, there's no enjoyment of life, do you know what I mean? You don't really get to enjoy life because you're either that busy or that scared that you need to deal with something or do something. It's, people say, oh, it's easy money. It's fucking no, I do you know what I mean? Money. It's uh, far from easy money. And as you say, like, uh, there's so many great people I've met that are in that game, do you know what I mean? And with great generous people kind people people that helped me through my prison Absolutely. sentence um and and these people were, would go on you're full of a lot of you full of shite do you know what i mean and that's fine they i believe they're the same as you they're just not that moment where they want to change but i just i i, I don't know like I, I you hear things and you just hear people going to groups and then they'll go oh so and so is at the group and everybody just shuts up because they mm -hmm. And you, don't, you can't get vulnerable in front of certain people. And I think they need to realise that. They need to realise that, put like James spoke about it, James spoke about having a rehabilitative setting mm. in the prison and having, I mean, Scotland's small, Eddie. It's no massive. Absolutely. You could have... 8,000 prisoners. How many, how many jails are in the actual central belt? Mm -hmm. There's a lot. Do you know mm. what I mean? It's no... It's not... It's, I mean, if you're badly behaved, you get punted up to Aberdeen anyway. Yeah. So it's not as if they don't do it. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, we'll move on to kind of more positive stuff, Eddie, right? So we'll move on to kind of recovery. Um, oh. your, your field, right? We'll move on to kind of recovery and how how recovery's been for you, what you've actually achieved through recovery. Um, John, you go, you'll take, you take it away. You can just kind of tell us how you, you how it started and how, how it all kind of fell into place. I'm a very fortunate man, to be honest with you, Sean. The people that introduced it in my life, it was addiction was a conundrum for me. It always baffled me. I didn't know why I was doing what I was doing. There was Aye. times, numerous times, in fact, I tried to stop using drugs twice a week for 17 years in prison, Aye. man. I was just, it was Aye. always a battle, Sean. I actually you know do me? remember it. I do remember you. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember it you. It was always a battle, mate. And I'm uh, done, mate, Sean. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, mate. And I, I, I remember coming to the and going, this is my first time I'm really trying to stop. You know what I mean? So I got introduced to a, 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 a fellowship, a 12-step fellowship. And, and and it was it was amazing for me. It was like I remember walking in, and the re I'll tell you the reason why. I've got a family member who 
when I went away, he was right in the midst of it all. Mm-hmm. He was really in the, right in the, in the rear of addiction and he was just, he was lost, you know what I mean? Uh, and I came I came out of prison five years later and, and he turned his life around about. Now, every time I left the guy, I just felt that wee bit happier. Yeah, right? Right. But I thought, I'm not doing what he's doing because what you just said a minute ago, I'm thinking he's a crackpot. Aye, that's, aye. Honestly, that's what I was saying, aye. do you know what I mean? But every time I left the guy, man, I just felt a wee bit happier. Now, I didn't know what was happening at that time, but what was happening, Sean, was see his energy and his Aye. passion for his zest mm-hmm. for life. Aye. It was weird. It was rubbing off on mm-hmm. me, mate, right? And I didn't know it. And eventually I thought, you know what? I- I'm going to try and get a wee what shot. What about that? that? So it was, like, it was like somebody's, it was like a role model. It was somebody's mm-hmm. example that, that that showed me you could live another way of life. So he was the first really member of my family to go out of it. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I followed him into recovery. And I, and I went to my very first ever meeting and I walked into a meeting one night and it was just like, I just felt a love, man. Mm-hmm. Felt a connection. That's mm-hmm. what I felt, right? Something that I hadn't experienced for a long time because that type of lifestyle, what you do, you, you experience a sense of separation. Aye. Right? You need to, to, Aye, to survive. Absolutely. And that, that's from people, but it's also mm-hmm. from yourself as well. And I went here, that, that I went to that meeting that night and there were people who I just felt really connected to. They, they, I felt an understanding. And an acceptance as well. Mm-hmm. And I thought, see whatever these people are doing, that's what I'm going to do. And, and, I, and I wholeheartedly threw myself into recovery. And I, and I got, you know, I was like, my, the passion man just came right. I went with a guy who spent 20 years in the street to a Aye. guy who didn't let her in the street, basically overnight, by the way. Aye. In a period of a few short months, showing my life absolutely transformed me. Aye. But the issue that I had was, and we, we talk about this all the time, the transition period can be really, really difficult. I know. The change can be difficult, man. That's hence the reason why we don't hold meetings in football stadiums. We hold it in wee church halls with 15, 20, 30 people in it, mate. You know what I mean? And uh, what happened to me was I got too much too soon. Mm -hmm. So I got in a relationship. I actually got the opportunity to become the greatest gift that I've had in recovery to this day, by the way. Mm -hmm. I got uh, the opportunity to be cared for my wee stepfather, Big Jim, who had... He got diagnosed with dementia Aye. and I kind of put my life on hold and went and looked for him. It's still to this day, it's been the greatest gift I've ever had, Aye. by the way. I learned so much off him. Big Jim was a, a spiritual giant man. He was 33 Aye. years over. He was just an absolute gentleman. Aye. And in the three years I, I, I was kind of there to support him, I learned so much. So I was doing that. I'll get in a relationship and, and see what happens. See when you're, uh, <laughs> see when you experience trauma when you're younger, right? And you start using substances to deal with that trauma. Aye. What happens is you don't pass through the emotional development stages. No. You don't grow up, I know. basically, right? So at 45 years of age, I come into recovery and I put a drink and drugs down. And I'm a 45-year-old man with the emotions of an 11-year-old boy. <laughs> I know. And, I, 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 and I'm in a relationship. Right? <laughs> That's why it's suggested that you don't get in relationships. I, I don't know I, I mean, find yourself first. And I don't think recovery is about finding out who you are. I, I think recovery is about finding out who you know. I, See all the characters that we, we, we mm-hmm. present to other people. All the... Fake characters. All that, all that nonsense. Mm-hmm. All the I, character chairs, you know what I mean? Uh, we let all that stuff go and see what you're left with. That's who you are. Mm-hmm. So my first year in recovery, I was in a relationship, care of my dad, and and I, and I started a wee business as well because basically I was unemployable at that time. Mm-hmm. I had no experience and no qualifications, no 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 uh, j- job like criminal opportunities. Record, all that kind of stuff. Criminal right, record was right. going to stop me for getting mm-hmm. any work. Right, so I started a wee business, which was really tough, mm-hmm. and I didn't really have the emotional maturity to deal with all these things. And what's happened is. So my recovery's first and then it starts coming down the pecking order a wee bit because I'm in a relationship, I'm caring for Jim. And before you wrote, my recovery's fourth. Aye. Now, what I believe is recovery is not just a thing that I do, Sean. Recovery is a way of life. It is. Right? So all these things came before it. And what happens is I, 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 I relapse. Mm-hmm. And I say, I tell the story that at 16 months clean, I went back out just to make sure I was an addict. <laughs> I think a lot of people do that, but don't they? Aye. Mm-hmm. Well, it's an admitting and recurring condition, addiction is. And if you're mm-hmm. not treating it, whatever model of recovery you're using, if you're not treating that addiction, you will mm-hmm. relapse. Because that's the condition it is. And what that taught me about, Sean, was that see anything that I put in front of my recovery, I'm going to lose it anyway. Mm-hmm. Right? And uh, so my recovery's got to come first. Mm-hmm. It's like you start a jigsaw, but you've got the, the opposite of that is you've got your recovery in the middle and everything else comes in about it. it aye. My. So recovery me has been amazing. You know what I mean? And, and, and I'm in long-term recovery now and, and the opportunities that that's gave me in itself. But everything that I've got today is because I came into a fellowship and I, and I found out that I, what I suffered for, the disease mm-hmm. of addiction. 
Yeah, and I believe Aye. it as an illness, Sean. Aye. Yeah, and the reason I know, I believe it's an illness is through my own experience of when I started to treat that illness, mm -hmm. my addiction fell away. And mm -hmm. when I started to develop emotionally and, 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 and grow up, mm -hmm. basically, and create that level of mm -hmm. consciousness and awareness that you spoke about, I don't live my life the way I used to live it anymore. No, I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't get the argument when people say it's not an illness. We're not talking about an illness as in like it's a mental illness that you would say you wouldn't say to somebody with schizophrenia, like um, who's trying to do things to help himself with schizophrenia. You wouldn't say like that's not an illness. Do you know what I mean? With addiction, it's the why you're addicted that makes it an illness. It's the you wouldn't say somebody that's traumatized because they've witnessed what you witnessed at 10 year old, mm. that that's not going to impact on your mental health. But unfortunately you found at that time, a good solution mm -hmm. in drugs, which works for a week, but then you're chasing that all the time. Do you know what I mean? That first kind of, cause it's not just an, emo it's not just a physical pain killer. You're talking about a very strong drug that, that takes over your mind and, and, and it's an emotional pain killer. So see when you kind of regulate your emotions, that allows you to regulate your emotions and become the person that you think that you should be. Absolutely. So I don't think when you're medicating yourself to fix that, how is it no an illness? Do you know what I mean? When you're using medicine, how is it no an illness? Do you know Absolutely. what I mean? Because that is what you're doing. Mm -hmm. If you went to the doctor, they would give you the exact same thing in a pill form, mm -hmm. but you're just using it illicitly. So it's, I don't get that. I don't get the argument that it's no an illness. But um, obviously looking at your kind of, integration back into society Eddie, because a lot of people struggle with that like trying to integrate back maybe um looking at maybe people that, the community that you talk maybe do you know what i mean and how they they accept you back now and um these are all stuff that's kind of tough journey do you know what i mean like mm -hmm. for people so how did you feel all that how did that kind of how was that was that tough or was it was it quite rewarding or integration is really difficult Aye. that the transitional period by the time you stop or you get away from that lifestyle or, or when you stop using substances, that transitional period where you learn to use healthier coping strategies in your life can, can be really difficult because remember you're experiencing a lot of unresolved trauma that you've got Aye. to be dealing with, right? So because you go through a model of recovery, that doesn't take away your trauma. Your trauma's still there. Mm -hmm. All you do is learn healthier coping strategies, mm -hmm. but they need to be then implemented in your life all the way throughout your life. Aye. Do you know what I mean? So, so I can... Even today, 11 and a half years sober, I can still experience stuff that's happened in my past. Yeah, of course. The mm -hmm. only difference today, Sean, is that I've got, I've got tools to deal with mm -hmm. that. So so we're talking about integration. Or, 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 when I'm speaking to professionals and they ask me how difficult it is to come into recovery, I say, you go try and sell on crack <laughs> or, or, or go and do a year in the Scottish prison Aye. system, see what Aye. your first three months is like. Mm -hmm. You all adapt mm -hmm. and see what that's like. Aye. So like, you just mentioned the experience you had with the funeral when you gravitated towards mm -hmm. the guys. That's why, mm -hmm. because you're comfortable with that. So it's like when we leave prison, Sean, right? Nobody leaves prison. I don't think most people don't leave prison with the intention of coming back. Invariably, that's what happens right. to most mm -hmm. of us, right? But you build up resilience in prison. And, all you, and what you say to yourself is, I'm going to settle down. I'm going to get a wee mm -hmm. job. I'm going to get a bird. <laughs> right, right. That's the part, <laughs> right? We're going to get a girlfriend. And I'm going to get a job and I'm going to settle down. That's right. what you want to do. So see how that resilience you built up? That's what you mean to do when you get... And I'm going right. to stay off of drinking drugs, mm -hmm. right? So you get out, you get in a relationship, you've got emotions of living your old boy, you realise that you can't deal with emotions mm -hmm. in a relationship, right? So you start looking for work, but you can't get work because... You can't even get an interview because... I know. You've got all these previous convictions that's going to bar you if you get into any... Most types of roles. Right. And, uh, and, and so what happens is, see, after a period of time, I had hurdle after hurdle after hurdle... That resilience that you built up, that resilience away. wanes. And mm -hmm. what happens when your resilience wanes, like any other human being in life, you'll go back to what you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're comfortable with taking a substance, that's what you're going to return to, or a, or, or a risk-taking behaviour, or back to criminality, you will go back to that. So my experience with uh, the transition was uh, I had really good people in my life. That mm. that's that's a must. That's a requirement to, to recover. Aye, I think definitely, it's massive. You, you you need people in your life that can take you through that journey. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was very very fortunate uh, that there was people, really good people in my life that I could be accountable to, and I could get vulnerable with. Aye. You know what I mean? And I could I could express it. I was maybe feeling. Can you imagine then 
shots prison. If I thought he says who shot him, feeling a wee bit vulnerable with him. You never spoke to him again, know, mate. Do you know, know what I mean? But I had men in my life where I could go to do that. See, I always thought, and, it, and we talk about it's a Western Scotland thing. It's no, it's a male thing that we, right. we don't want to get vulnerable in front of each mm -hmm. other because you're told just to like pull your socks up, go on, mate. You're a man. Mm -hmm. That stuff, right? That 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 stuff can kill you. By the way, it does kill. It kills a lot of people, and it's getting younger and younger. Do you Absolutely. know what I mean? Um, but Absolutely. no, I agree with you. Eddie. So the strength, what I've learned is the strength is to go to go and speak about my vulnerabilities and stuff like that to people, and and just start to grow up in recovery. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I'm really passionate. Aye. I'm passionate about my life. I've got a zest for life. Aye. You know, I'm 58 years of age mm -hmm. and it's the youngest I've ever felt. Aye. I'm the skintest I've ever been in my life Aye. and it's the richest I've ever Aye. felt. I know. Do you know what I mean? And that's a recurring theme in this podcast and all, by the way, we football players, actors, like, oh yeah, do you know what I mean? It's Aye. like, it's, a, it's definitely a recurring theme. Absolutely, man. So, um, obviously we'll move on to kind of your own kind of harbour. Um, what you're actually up to the new Eddie, how that's going. So obviously Harbour's been absolutely so successful, brilliant charity. Um so can you just tell us a wee bit about it? Aye, but I'll go I'll go back a wee step. Aye. If you don't mind, Sean, because I want there's people in that's been in my journey that I, I would like to mention and aye, thank aye, because of is it the people that's in my life just in the my recovery, the people mm -hmm. who's been in my life has been in a professional aspect aye. as well. James being one of them aye. actually. So, so when I, I, my very first ever job, I was two and a half years in recovery and, and my first real foray into employment was with the violence reduction. Mm -hmm. uh, the year before that, we had uh, the violence reduction and took 30 ex-offenders to the Commonwealth Games. I remember that. So, and the, the great thing about that is it was actually in the next building to where we were in the new that my is journey it? started with the violence reduction. <laughs> it's just at the top of the road. <laughs> so I remember uh, going for an interview to go to the, the violence reduction and it was a guy called Inspector Ian Murray who was a great mentor of mine at that time and, and uh, as until the, the present time. So I went for an interview with Inspector Ian Murray and uh, it was the first time Sean we were an interview with the police where my reply was no comment. I got you going. And the, the guy, the guy, the guy's, he asked me about my previous convictions. See, looking back at my lifestyle, right, and I, I, and I, I laugh about it and I joke about it, right, that right? my, Behaviour has really had an impact on people's lives, right. mate. And, that, and I'll, we say in recovery, we don't regret our past. There's two things I regret about my past. One is that the people that got hurt in my right. past, right? And I try my best to live mm -hmm. the life I live today mm -hmm. to make up for that. And the other thing that I regret my past is my wee mother never seen me getting clean. Because right. that was all she ever wanted, Sean, right? So it, with, after that interview with Ivan Stuxion, a year later I got a... a, a opportunity to go and to go to go and do an interview right. with him to, to get a role and they took me on as a, a mentor uh, and the project the, the 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 what do you call it the the gig in the, the Commonwealth Games was a kind of forerunner it was a pilot project Aye. to what we're going to do and we brave our industries it was at the Aye. time we had to change that name because it had connotations <laughs> to, to other organisations and it was changed to Street and Arrow Aye. and I, I worked with the, in Glasgow with the young men and women in Glasgow to try and get them back into employment and stuff like that so it was a great experience for me and we was away in, in Glasgow uh, we saw it was away in Edinburgh we had a meeting with, it was Angela Constance. Aye. Uh, so Ian and Karen McCluskey arranged a meeting with, with Angela Constance and Ken McCaskill, he was a justice man Aye. at the time. So they were there and they were talking about all oh, the opportunity. It was, was for 25 year olds when we go back to Glasgow and they just kept talking about all these. And I, and I come in and I says, that's all good and well and I'm, and I'm glad you're mm -hmm. doing that, that's brilliant. But what about guys like me? Who, 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 who have got but loads of experience and, 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 and that they can pass on to Aye. people we can help people with and Karen McCluskey turned around and she says to me she says don't you worry she says I've got big plans for you when you go back to Glasgow brilliant no, no she says Karen's brilliant so we went into so we're into that, that that role and then so every every role I've been in and then I went to navigate a role where I worked, people in, worked with people in acts of emergency and every role I was in kind of so some it was employment some it was social issues and some it was addiction mm -hmm. and all these roles that I, that I had shown in the last nine nine years it led me to, to Harbour Ayrshire so that started with a conversation that a friend and I a, a fr pal of mine's, uh, Clive Kennedy, Clive's a, a local businessman mm -hmm. in South Ayrshire and he wanted to do a wee bit for his local community. He was doing stuff up in Glasgow for the homeless, but he had, he'd done well through his business and he wanted to kind of put back into communities mm -hmm. and recover himself. Right. So he, he came to me and says, uh, 
Eddie, what, what, what do you want to do? He says, and he was asking me about advice about what we should be doing in, in Ayrshire and stuff, or what he could do in Ayrshire. And I said, well, why don't you open a, a residential? Uh, but it's uh, only needed, isn't it? Absolutely. But it's in response to drug-related mm. deaths, so that's what we're talking about, because we're losing people. We're in recovery ourselves. We're losing mm. people Aye. that's came, coming into mm. recovery showing left, right and centre. So that was what we came up with. So we managed. So Clive says to me, how would you like to be involved in something like that? I says, I would absolutely love to be involved in something like that. And he says, hey, right, okay, so we'll, so him and I and, and one of our accountants, uh, John Gillardy, got together and we, get, we managed to get a meeting with Angela Constance, who was just the, the, the drugs minister at the time. So through a, an MSP in a local area called, called uh, Siobhan Brown. So Siobhan got us an interview. So when we get to meet with Angela, she went, I love your passion. <laughs> I love your enthusiasm. She says, I love you, Eddie. She right. met Angela a couple of times. She says, what I remember about you guys in the Commonwealth Games, you're running about cuddling everybody, saying we do hugs, not drugs. <laughs> 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 so she says, but nobody's going to give you money for a residential uh, if that you're here for, right? But what she did say, she went, I'll give you about free advice. She says, go into your local community, get your brand name known out there, get, build relationships with the statutory services, with the third sector services mm -hmm. and with the funders and see where that takes you. So from that advice, we come back and that's when Harbour Ayrshire actually started. Brilliant. And it's an amazing organisation, Sean. It's a lived experience mm -hmm. organisation. Everybody in Harbour has, has got a lived experience of coming through addiction and coming through the other side. Of it. Aye. Even our trustees has been impacted by it by one way mm -hmm. or another. And, and it's just a really positive forward solution focused organization mm. we, we, we just want to do the best for people and it's had a huge impact in a very short period of time it's had a huge impact on my communities it's um it's not it's amazing and i can imagine that you'd be able to take in like all the different roles like obviously you've came for like petty crime organized crime community recovery you've done navigating you've seen social issues um you've obviously been through the vru so you've got an abundance of experience already that you can take into the community and it's solely needed in a way. I don't know. I mean, I look, I, we actually, I've done a podcast with uh, Alas, a Fern, who's a absolutely brilliant. She's done a doctorate on kind of youth crime and stuff. And we were talking about just how that that's changed and the, the, the different, and I think it's just trying to keep up with the different trends and see people like I say, lady, you've got, that background where you can still tap into if you need to know what's happening with drug trends and where, like, do you know what I mean? If you need to know what's happening in the streets, you'll still be able to find that out. And that's massive because you can keep going with Harbour and updating it and evolving it Absolutely. to like suit the kind of streets, do you know what I mean? Or suit the kind of lifestyle. Because um, as we say, we, you know, I mean, I don't know where the posh areas are in, in, in doing, doing your way, but you don't have uh, Harbour and all these places in Mulgay and Bearsden and Jordan Hill, do you know what I mean? These, these, these are places that don't need. So it's um, it's always going to bring back to the deprived areas, do you know what I mean? It's always going to come back here. So I think it's amazing what you're doing, I think it's absolutely brilliant. Um, and obviously we'll have yeah, the Harbour logo up, we'll have the kind of helpline and stuff like that. So. Um, is it only Ayrshire people you're dealing with, is it, or is it at it's, the moment? It's ha Harbour Ayrshire. What, what we've got, we're spread the other, the other length and breadth of Ayrshire. What, what we've done, we, we do, we've got, we use volunteers. Uh, volunteers is the mainstay of the organisation. When we first founded Harbour, there basically was only me and myself. So we started Aye. to, and Clive funded the role, we started to just use volunteers uh, for a couple of reasons. One was... Uh, but with what the, what the model that we've got is we want to get people out of crisis, Sean, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's coming through the addiction or criminal justice system or some sort of crisis, mental health. And what we want to do is get them support for that, that, that issues, whatever mm -hmm. the, the, the issues are. Uh, either from Harbour, where they want to want to do new, or I was supporting them at the time, mm -hmm. or referring them into other services and organisations. And I've got a lot of relationships because I've worked in this field for 10 Aye. years down there as well, which is really good mm -hmm. for us, working in partnership with different organisations. So we get people out of crisis, but when they get to 30 days, because we're an absence-based organisation, mm -hmm. I, I believe the only one way to get after drugs is to get mm -hmm. after drugs, yeah. Know that I'm against harm reduction. I've referred as many people onto mm -hmm. harm reduction who then have Aye. supported away for harm reduction. If somebody's using intravenous heroin mm -hmm. intravenously and they're breaking a lot of funder habit, then if a great get, mm -hmm. step next to that is to get harm reduction, but I believe there's got to be an exit strategy mm -hmm. is to get people off and to get get them off of drinking drugs so they can they can deal with underlying issues because 
because to, to process, see the stuff I was speaking about with my father and that earlier on, to process the emotions, I can't be, I can't be uh, under any substances no. because I'll not process emotions. I'll still push it down, even if I'm not doing it intentionally. And the, stub, the substance pushes it down anyway. Absolutely. Then I, Absolutely. I, so if you can get abstinence and you can process his emotions, so when the guys get to 30 days, you can come and help with Harbour. Mm-hmm. So we want them to go and start their own model recovery, whatever that is, whatever way they're going to do it. We introduce them to all different opportunities and, and different options for that. And at 30 days, up until the 30 days, even if they're, if they're reducing half their, their medication or their ORT or whatever the case may be, we've got a community support vehicle. So the community support vehicle is a, we get in the community and we're, 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 we're uh, supporting maybe people fleeing violence or, or, or women like leaving, mm-hmm. uh, having to leave, fleeing the abusive relationships or homeless people. So it's like, and it's a brilliant bit of service, by the way. Uh-huh. Great for the people that's receiving the support, but also for the volunteers. Mm-hmm. I, I speak about redemption, Sean, no, no in a religious sense, right? But in the, the, the precise definition of a clearing of a debt. Mm-hmm. So see the young, the, the, these people that's young in recovery. Uh, to get the opportunity to go and do that because if you've if you've lived that lifestyle mm-hmm. right you've when you come into recovery you're full of guilt and shame for how you've lived your life now if which is one of the mitigating factors that take you back to addiction again oh, right. mm-hmm. because when you're f- experiencing that guilt and shame what happens is where he'd says i know what will take this away mm-hmm. and you'll go back to substances because of how you've lived your life mm-hmm. drinking or using substances so these guys get a chance to 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 any for their any guilt and shame they've got for a, for a past life, then they get a chance to make amends for that past life. So they get to restore that the relationships they've got with their community. Aye. So it, it's it's really it's really a profound service. By the way, when I was driving home a couple of weeks ago with two boys in the van, I looked round. I just seen the two of them just sitting. We were sitting in silence, and it was just a, it was a look in their faces, and I say so. See that what you're experiencing at the moment. It was just contentment is what you're seeing in the boys' faces, Aye. right? See that it's what you're experiencing. That's what you've wanted all your life. You Aye. just chased it in the wrong places. Aye. So, so the, the boys can get thirty days. They can come and help us. But once they get to six months, once they've been through their a wee bit of journey, a bit of mm-hmm. time away for their lifestyle, and maybe through a, a therapeutic model, then they can come and volunteer with Harbour. Aye. So, and the goal is is to get them trained, up, skilled, get them developed. Uh, with, the, with the aim of getting them into full time employment, mm-hmm. in year one we had eight people for that lifestyle. Who some of them had never worked in years and years, and some had never worked mm-hmm. into full time employment. And this year, half five through year two, we've had double the numbers into full time employment. Sean, some Brilliant. of them working with Harbour, and some of them working with different different agencies. Excellent, Eddie. Brilliant. And um, so, MD, that's kind of MD for Ayrshire can just obviously the, 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 the get in contact if obviously they need to be. Can I abstinent before the contact or can the no, contact no. No. No, 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 So the contact and just kind of yeah. any, any way, any crisis there's and just no, there's not many people contact me that's abstinent. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I know. A lot of my food bugs, but you want to help, I know. No, 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 no. When people phone us up, they're, they're in crisis. Right. So we've got a helpline that you say you're going to put Aye. a number out there. And although we are, we, we're, we're Harbour Ayrshire, so we're focused on Ayrshire, but the length and breadth of Ayrshire. Mm-hmm. Another thing with these peer support groups is volunteers. We've got 40 volunteers. Wow. So you've got uh, you've got volunteers uh, providing service in these groups from Girvan to Glen Garnock, which is a tip and a toe to, to Ayrshire. It's a Aye. massive, a massive uh, geographical distance we cover. And that's for, we've got men's groups because we found it better for a couple of reasons to, to separate the men for the women, the women. one's an obvious reason, but the second reason Aye. is that men will not get vulnerable in front of women, and women could or may Aye. have had Makes negative sense. experience to, to men, and they'll not get, they can't get vulnerable because mm-hmm. they don't feel safe. So we've got men's groups, uh, women's groups, and we've got family groups now as well. Brilliant. So I was getting phone calls, 50% of the phone calls I was getting was through family members looking for a support for a loved one. Mm-hmm. And what I could say at that time was I might or I may or I may not be able to help your loved one, mm-hmm. depending on where they're, they're at Aye. and if they're ready to accept the support. But I, I, I couldn't offer the family member support. So we opened a family support group, which took half. And now we've got three family groups in North, East and South Asia. The South Asia one just Brilliant. opened a couple of weeks ago. And there was 16 family members. Or there was 16 years, five years and 11 family members. And 10 of the family members were the first ever peer support family group Aye. and it was one um, the, 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 the energy and the emotions in the room was 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 something to, something to, 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 to I know it's, it's, it's a lot of these people see like, like you spoke about your wee mammy earlier a lot of people 
me personally, I find the family work harder. Mm. I, I find it harder um, talking to somebody's ma or somebody's granny or whatever. I, I, that's harder for me than um, working with guys that are. I don't. I don't know why, but it just is. I've just. I, don't, I find it harder to um, give answers and stuff to parents and stuff that are in it. So it's. It's, um, it's any, any of these groups are well needed, and it's like um, somebody like your Mac could have been like get, go to the support and realised it because you don't know you don't know how people think and how much they blame themselves and that, that was that my fault. He's like that, wasn't it? Your story, I mean, you couldn't write your story. Your story was always going to end that way, Eddie. With that, do you know what I mean? Like the way you've started at ten year old, experiencing that and a dysfunctional family, there wasn't he much room for it to go in, in elsewhere. Do you yeah, know what I mean? So I think um, I honestly can't compliment you enough how how well you've done and how amazing your journey's been. Thanks, do you know man. what I mean? But um, so just as we're coming up to the end, Eddie, right? I always give my my guest the kind of last wee hang. I said to one the other day, and he, he was like, ah, um, "What do you mean? Like, what have you talk about it? Like, put right in the spot." <laughs> uh, so just a wee message, see for like anybody that's watching this that might be kind of an addiction recovery, like anybody. Do you know what I mean? Just a wee a wee message for for somebody, a support message or whatever. No, absolutely. I think I've tried to answer this question for you three times, but the <laughs> answer is we only work with Ayrshire, but the helpline number that you're going to put up, there is support in all different areas, Aye. so if you can phone the helpline, we can get you support in your local areas, because we've got contacts in, in, in most places, and, the, and if we don't, we'll find them for you. So the message, I suppose, that I've got shown to people that's maybe listening is that you say that at the start of this, that if somebody like myself who's lived the lifestyle that I've led, can get out of it, then, then change is possible. Change is possible for anyone. Uh, and, and we see it time and time again. I mean, the, the staff that I've got around about is they're just, I mean, they're just phenomenal. They're Aye. just hard working, they're here doing, they go on with it. They, they're all in recovery themselves, so they've got a passion, they've got a zest, mm. A for life, but B for their own recovery. Mm. And all they want to do is help people. And if you get introduced to somebody like that, and, and you've got to be at that space. Aye. What, what happens, Sean, is that the times in my life where I was wanting to stop or, or, or wanting to turn my life around about, that's moments of clarity. That's windows of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Right? So so like any window, it'll open and it'll close. Mm -hmm. And it's in the window of opportunity where you need to access the support. So I believe that the desperation, what happens, the magic happens when the desperation and the solution come together at the same time. Right. Now, I was desperate to stop using drugs for 20 years, mm -hmm. right? And the solution was actually, the moral recovery I use was actually in my house for 30 years. <laughs> so the desperation was here for 20 years and the solution was for 30. <laughs> but the two of them never came together at Aye. the same time. So to, for your viewers that's out there, maybe people that's struggling, see if you're at that place where you're desperate to mm. stop using drugs. And, and there really really needs to be a level of desperation, Sean. I know. We, we talk about desperation being a gift, actually as a gift, because mm -hmm. that's what, that's a, that's a, the driving force for us to change. Mm -hmm. Change always comes at the back of some sort of pain. So if there's people out there that are at that place where they're ready to change, they're in that state of desperateness, I know the solution. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if we can't help you do the inertia, then we'll introduce you to people who can. So, so if you're out there and you're looking for a wee bit of help, the, 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 sorry, the Harbour Helpline number is up mm. there. Please give me a phone. It's it's an out-hours helpline. So it's Monday to Friday, 5 to 10, and Saturday and Sunday it's on for 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. And there'll always be a listener near there for you, somebody who understands what you're going through. So give us a wee phone and we'll see what we can do for you. Brilliant. Thanks for coming on, Eddie. Excellent. Brilliant. Good man, Sean. Thanks for having Excellent. us, man. It was a pleasure. Brilliant.